Good morning, everybody. So uh, we're going to pick up today's lecture where more we left off in last lecture. Oh, hang on. Sorry, I'm trying to adjust the volume here, but uh, I have no control over the volume. Okay. All right, so we were talking about uh, floating point numbers and how they're represented on your computer, uh, or I guess um, quote unquote real numbers and how they're represented on your computer. Uh, so Java has two floating point types, there's float and double. Uh, they both come from this standard called IEEE 754. Uh, so the standard says float is a, sorry, the standard says that you can have a 30, uh, 32-bit floating point number or a 64-bit uh, floating point number um, or larger. Uh, so there's 128-bit floating point numbers as well. Uh, so Java calls the 32-bit 32 32 version float and it calls the 64-bit version double. In Python, everything is just 64 bits and it's called float, short for floating point. Um, now, uh, I guess it would be informative to actually study how these types, uh, how the IEEE standard uh, says these numbers ought to be represented, but it's very awkward. Right? Every time I wanna write down a floating point number, I have to write down 32, 32 or 64 zeros and ones. Right, uh, and that's no fun, right? So you don't wanna watch me try to scribble down 32 zeros or ones, right? Also, most people aren't used to reading binary, right? So we're used to working in decimal, uh, and so it would be nice if we could study this um, and uh, work in decimal instead of in binary. Now fortunately, the standard says uh, you can, uh, there is a standard for decimal values as well. Uh, so that's nice. Uh, but we're not going to look at that either. Uh, instead, we're going to look at a, rever uh, a reduced version uh, so that we can actually write down numbers in a convenient way. Uh, all the ideas are still the same as what's in the standard. Right? So instead of using 32 or 64 zeros and ones, I'm going to use four uh, decimal digits, so zero through nine. Right? And so our representation is going to look like this. So we have three. Uh, decimal digits, right, so uh, values between zero and nine. Right? The first value, for simplicity, we're not gonna let it be zero. Right? So in other words, uh, D1 has to be at least one. We're not gonna worry about the sign. Right? The standard actually specifies how the sign is represented. We don't care, we're just gonna write down plus or minus. Uh, and then over here, there's an exponent. Right? So our number is gonna be some integer value times 10 raised to some exponent here. Now we want to use one digit up here to represent the exponent, so a value between zero or nine. Um, if we want values less than one, we need to be able to make this exponent negative. So uh, our value D4, we're gonna subtract five from it. So if D4 is between zero and nine, the total exponent is between minus five and four. Right? Uh, and so that's what our numbers are gonna look like. So that looks a lot like this, right? So back here, right? That's the binary representation of a floating point number, some integer times two raised to some exponent, right? Ours is some integer times 10 raised to some exponent, right? Okay, so if you start to scribble down what numbers can I write down or what numbers can I represent using this representation, uh, you get a table that looks like this. So what's the smallest, what's the uh, smallest positive value that you can write down? Well, our first digit has to be a one, right? Uh, if I want the smallest number, the next two digits have to be a zero, right? And now I want my smallest exponent, so that's minus five, right? And if you scribble that out in decimal, you get 0 0.00100. So that's the smallest positive value I can represent, right? If my value is less than 0 0.001, there's no way for me to represent it exactly. Right? I, don't have a, I don't have sufficient number of digits to do so. So the next question you can ask is, well, uh, what's the next number I can write down and, and represent exactly? Right? Well, that's just 101 times 10 to the minus five. So that's 0 0.00101. Right? If there's a number in between these two that I want to write down, I can't write it down exactly. I'm stuck using either this one or this one. 
right? So if I'm closer to 0 0.001, I my number gets converted to 0 0.001, and if I'm closer to 0 0.0101, I end up representing the number as 0 0.00101, right? And so right away, you can see that there's an, there's an impact of, uh, caused by the fact that we have a finite number of digits to represent our number, right? Uh, there's a lot of values, or there's an infinite number of value, uh, real numbers between these two values that I can't represent. Right? There's some smallest positive value. Um, there exists some smallest positive value. Right? Any value between zero and that value, I can't represent. So if you look at the difference between these two values, right, uh, you'll see if you compute it mathematically, it's 0 0.00001, right? the difference between these two values. Um, but if you pay attention to what's happening in the, in the last digit, right, because, we're, uh, because our digits start with an integer, adjacent numbers always differ by one in the last unit, right? So in this unit, in the uh, digit to the far, uh, on the far right, right, the next, uh, they always change by one. So the next value would be 102 times 10 to the minus five, right? And that would be 0 0.00102. And so the distance between adjacent floating point numbers is always one unit in the last place, right? So that's called an ulp, right? The ulp is the, uh, the, ulp is the um, distance between adjacent floating point values, right? Oops, sorry. Now notice that the value of an ulp, so the, sorry, the magnitude of an ulp changes depending on the magnitude of your number. Right, so here I've got something times 10 to the minus five, and ulp is one unit, right? But that unit is equal to one, uh, 0 0.00001. If the exponent changes to minus four, right, then the value of an ulp changes to 0 0.0001, right? So in other words, the distance between two adjacent uh, numbers changes depending on the magnitude of the exponent. The ulp, so I, I guess it's important, so the ulp here is still one, right? The difference in the, uh, the unit in the last place is still one. The difference here is still one, right? When you actually compute its uh, magnitude in decimal, uh, the value changes, right? So not only um, are there only a finite number of real number, uh, of floating point values, right? The distance between floating point values changes depending on its magnitude, right? If you go all the way up to the largest value that, uh, sorry, to exponent four, right? The smallest value that you can represent with an exponent four is uh, one million, right? So one with six zeros after it, right? The next largest, the next smallest value that you can represent is 101 times 10 to the four, which is 1,010,000, right? So if you had one million and one, you can't represent it exactly. Right? Even if you had 1,005,000, you can't represent that exactly either. You end up using either that value or that value, whichever one is closer. Right? And so right away you can see that floating point numbers are strange, right? Uh, and it all comes from the fact that you only got a finite amount of memory to represent each value, right? Fixed and finite, right? And this is the, uh, and so this is the reality of the situation that happens when you're doing uh, floating point arithmetic on a computer, right? Okay, so the ulp is the distance between uh, adjacent floating point values, right? That value, that number, sorry, the magnitude of that value changes depending on the magnitude of your exponent, right? Uh, when people talk about errors when using floating point numbers, they often talk about uh, errors in ulps. Right? Um, so if you wanna know what is the magnitude of an ulp, uh, you can ask Java for it, right? So if you have some value, I would like to know what is the value of an ulp for 1.0, you can pass, you can call uh, the method math dot ulp and pass in 1.0. Uh, and uh, Java will tell you what is the magnitude of an ulp for the value 1.0. Okay, so uh, if you're working with floating point numbers, um, you might be, uh, you might start out with a problem where you have uh, some value that you know, right? So suppose you start out with a value one or something like that. You compute some value that you also expect to be one, right? So 
I'm expecting my true value, x hat, to be one, right? I compute some other number that I expect to be one, right? So that's x, and I would like to know what is the error between those two values, right? So the error is just x hat minus x, and then you take its absolute value, right? So that's the um, error uh, between the two values. Uh, it's, called, it's called the absolute error. Right? So uh, when you're working with floating point numbers, this, uh, you end up with an error almost immediately when you write down your floating point number, there's a high probability that it can't be represented exactly uh, in your floating point format. Right? And so 0 0.2 has no exact representation in binary. Right? And so that means that the number that we start out with wasn't really 0 0.2, there's some error. So when you convert a real value into the, uh, to its floating point value, so when I convert 0 0.2 to a double on my computer, the IEEE standard says you must be within one half an ALP when you do that conversion. Right? You might say, well, why do I have to be within one half an ALP? Well, it makes sense, right? So we go back here to the table, right? So suppose I have the number one million and one, right? Uh, I can't represent one million and one exactly, so I have to pick one of the two numbers that it's between, right? To you, uh, to, uh, and use that to represent one million and one. And so in this case, obviously I'm gonna choose one million. Right? What's the error in ALPS? Well, one million and one minus one million, so there's a one all the way over here, right? Uh, and so the error in ALPS would be zero, well, you wanna compute it using this digit here, so it'd be zero, 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 one. So 0 0.00001 ALPS are there, right? Eventually, if you get to uh, one million five thousand, you have to pick one of these two values, right? And so your error is gonna be 5,000, so that's a five, zero, 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 and so your error in ALPS will be 0 0.5, right? You're exactly halfway between two numbers, uh, two uh, floating point numbers, <coughs> right? And so when you convert uh, any uh, number to its floating point representation, that conversion has um, at most an error of one half an ALPS, right? You end up, uh, your actual number is halfway, but is uh, at worst halfway between two floating point values. Okay, so suppose uh, you're not worried about conversion, but instead you want to know uh, what is the error, or you, you're interested in calculating the error between a computed value and its true value, right? And then there's a recipe for computing its error in ALPS, right? And so what you do is you take your true value and you write it using our floating point representation, right? So I write it using three digits times 10 raised to some exponent. And then you do the same thing with the other value. Right? Now, when you do the same thing with the other value, with x, right, the thing that you have to remember here is that you must use the same exponent that you used when you wrote down the true value. Right? And so we'll see an exam examples of this shortly. Right? And now you simply take the difference after writing down their values uh, in your floating point format. Right? So for example, I have a true value of 1.29. Right? And I have a computed value of 1.25. Right? I want to know what is the error in ALPS. Right? Uh, so I compute its absolute error. So I start out by writing 1.29 in, in our floating point format. Right? So I need three digits, so it's 129. Right? Multiplied by 10 to something. So now you compute the something. Right? So here it has to be minus 2 so that you get 1.29, right? And you do the exact same thing with the 1.25, and you make sure that when you write down 1.25, right, you write it out with that exponent. So this one's easy, the exponent's the same. Like that, right? And now you just take the difference here. Right? So you do your subtraction, and you get four times 10 to the minus two, right? That number there is your error in ALPS. Right, so the unit in the last place of this number here, right, right there, is the error in ALPS. Now, it's a little bit deceiving. So if this number were bigger, then that whole thing would be the error in ALPS, right? Okay, so the key part here is to make sure that those two, expo those two exponents are always the same. Right. Uh, okay, so here's an example where when I write out 
these two numbers uh, in their floating point format, if you were to just write them out on their own, you would get two different numbers. Right? So here we have 12.1 and 0 0.5. Right? So 12.1 is 121 times 10 uh, to the minus 1. Right? 0 0.5, if I was to write it out in our actual floating point format, would be 500 times 10 to the minus uh, 3. So when you're computing the error, you don't want to write out the measured value or the um, computed value uh, in its correct form, right? You want to convert its exponent to minus one, right? So you want to do something times 10 to the minus one, right? And if you uh, scribble that out, it would be five, right? Times 10 to the minus one, right? And so now you do your subtraction. Right? And so when you do your difference, you get 116 times 10 to the minus 1. And so now you have a difference of 116 alts. Right? The reason you're making sure the exponent is the same is because I want the error relative to the 12.1. Right? So in other words, I want to compute its error in alts right? relative to the exponent, in this case, minus 1. Okay, so uh, often it's the case where, well not often, sorry, sometimes it's the case where your true value um, is a real number as opposed to some floating point number, right? So imagine you were, you're working on some mathematical problem and you know that the true value that you're computing should be equal to pi, right? Pi has an infinite number of digits, right? So how do you write that down in your floating point format? And the answer is, is you don't really, right? So you write down, in this case, I'm using this giant number here, Right? I'm going to write it out in our floating point format, but I'm going to keep all of the decimals, uh, all of the digits after the decimals. Right? So you only do this for the true value. So for your true value, I'm now going to write out 592.87, blah, 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 blah. Right? So I'm going to use more than three significant digits here. Right? For your second value, though, you're going to write it out correctly in our floating point format. So I'm only going to keep three digits for it. So that's 589 times 10 to the 2. Right, now you do your difference and it's 3.8, blah, 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 alt. Right, so it can be the case that your true value, x, right, has more than three significant digits in it. Um, and if that's the case, just keep them all. But remember, always write it out as some three-digit number times 10 to the, sorry, some three-digit uh, integer part times, uh, and, uh, times 10 to some integer exponent. Okay, you may occasionally come across the relative error, uh, especially if you're in the sciences, uh, I guess particularly physics and chemistry, maybe bio, I guess. Um, so the relative error is, is the absolute error divided by the true value, right? So if someone asks you to compute the relative error, uh, you don't go through all of this rigmarole of uh, writing things down in our floating point format, right? You just compute this as though it were um, actual regular mathematics and away you go. That's all I'm going to say about relative error for now. Okay, so uh, how does addition and subtraction work with floating point values, right? And so the way it works is uh, if the, you write out your two values that you're adding or subtracting in your floating point format, right? So here I've got 12.1 and 63.8. So what's 12.1 in our floating point format? Well, it's 121 times 10 to the minus 1. Right. What's 63.8? Well, it's 638 times 10 to the minus 1. Right. The exponents are the same here, so I can just add the two numbers just like you would in uh, grade school. Right. So add those two values, it's 759 times 10 to the minus 1. Right. If it's uh, subtraction, it's the exact same thing, Right. just subtract the two values. Here's another example, so 81,500. 13,600, just write out your two numbers in our floating point format. So 815 times 10 to the 2, 136 times 10 to the 2, and, and, and just add the two uh, integer parts. Right? Exponent stays the same. So that's 951 times 10 to the 2. Okay, now obviously if you're adding two values, you might end up generating an extra digit. Right? So if you add uh, two values, whose integer parts are bigger, uh, are bigger than 500, 
right? You're going to end up with an integer part that's greater than 999, right? And so what do you do? Well, you compute. You just do the exact same thing, right? So you write down 82.1 as 821 times 10 to the minus 1, right? You write out 63.8 as 638 times 10 to the minus 1. Go ahead and add. So this is our intermediate result now, right? So you take the sum and you end up with four digits. The problem is, in our floating point format, we've only got three, so I can't keep them all. Right? And so uh, we're going to say you round this value here. Right? So you round it to the uh, nearest second digit in this case. Right? So this becomes 1460 times 10 to the minus 1, right? which you can write properly using three digits here as 146 times 10 to the 0. Right? And so your final result is that. Uh, and notice that number there is not correct, right? It's not actually equal to the sum of 82.1 and 63.8, right? It should be 145.9, uh, but it's not. We can't represent 145.9 in our floating point format. So we're, uh, we end up computing the value 146 instead. Right? Another example here, right? Uh, write these, write both numbers out in our floating point format, Take, compute the sum, too many digits, right? Round to the nearest uh, second digit here, right? So this becomes 175 times 10 to the three, right? Exponent goes up by one in this case. Right? So if you ever compute a value and there's too many digits in it, we're gonna end up uh, rounding that uh, intermediate value and only keeping uh, the three digits. Okay, so what happens if the two values have a different exponent? Right? And so the rule is still the same as before when we computed uh, the error, right? You're, uh, it's, sorry, it's not exactly the same. You're going to use, uh, you're going to look at the number with the largest exponent, and that's the exponent you're going to use when you write down your other number, right? So if the two values have different exponents, then you use the exponent, uh, then the one with the smaller exponent, you have to scale it so that the exponents become the same. So 4,320,000 is 432 times 10 to the 4, right? 12.1, if you were to write it out properly, is 121 times 10 to the minus 1, right? I need to make these exponents match because what I want to do is basically I want to just sum these values here, right? So I can sum those values there using grade school math because the exponents are different. So I have to make this exponent the same as the other. I make the smaller exponent the same as the larger exponent, right? So the 121 becomes, well, it looks like I have to shift the decimal five places. So one, two, three, four, five. So it's going to be zero, zero, zero. 0 0.00121 times 10 to the 4. Let's make sure I did that right. So 1, 2, 3, 4. And the answer is yes, I did it right. Right? Did I do it right? 0, 0, 0. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Right? And now you can sum that number and that number. Right? So the exponents are now the same. And now you can go ahead and compute the sum to get the value on the slide. Right? So your intermediate result becomes 432.000121. And now, again, in the same, uh, you have the same problem as before. Right? I'm only allowed to keep three significant digits. Right? I need eight to actually represent the true value. Our floating point format only has three. So we have to uh, compute or discard everything after the decimal in this case to get 432 times 10 to the 4, right? So um, you can either discard all the digits, so just ignore them, or you can round. So if that's like a 5, you can round the 2 to a 3. Um, it doesn't matter which one you do in the course. Uh, it, uh, I don't actually know what a real, uh, sorry, real computers don't do it exactly this way anyway, right? Um, but it's uh, close enough for our purposes. Right. And so now you get 432 times 10 to the 4, right? Now, 
Look at your final answer. Right, 482 times 10 to the 4. Right, look at your two, the two numbers that you added together. Right? So the first number that I added together was 4,320,000. But that's 432 times 10 to the 4. Right? The second number is some positive value. Right? And so what's happening here is that you've got x plus y, where x and y are both positive, and the result is equal to x. Right? That number there is the same as that number there. So when I compute the sum, it's as though the 12.1 never existed in the first place. Right? x plus y equals x, y is not equal to zero. Right? So mathematically, this makes no sense, but this is what happens in floating point. So all the stuff you know from mathematics is only approximately true when you work in floating point, right? And you end up in strange situations um, where what makes sense mathematically doesn't make sense when you actually compute it on the computer. Right? Why does this happen? Well, I've only got, in the, I have a limited number, of, uh, limited number of bits to store my values, right? It's limited and it's fixed. So uh, you're going to run into situations where you compute a value and it uh, doesn't fit. Uh, and so you try to compute a value, and when you convert it to your floating point format, um, it doesn't give you the value that you expect. Okay, so, oh, what did we do here? Da, da, da. Okay, so, um, it might be possible uh, to that you, uh, in your representation, we're going to use three digits for the uh, significant, we're going to use one digit for the exponent, right? But when you're doing these calculations, um, it might be useful if you had some extra digits, right? So maybe in this case here, it wouldn't actually help in this case here, right? So unless I had, uh, sorry. It doesn't matter how many extra digits I have in this case here, I'm always gonna end up 432 times 10 to the four when I convert it back to our floating point format. But you can imagine there might be situations where if you had an extra digit in the intermediate result, uh, you might be able to um, get a better final result. Right? So, um, it would be nice if, you could do, if we had extra digits. Right, but in, uh, you have to remember that when you're doing these calculations, all this stuff is happening in hardware. So in your CPU, when you're adding these two numbers, it's all being done in hardware. So there's no way that you can just stick extra digits in hardware. Well, there's no easy way to do it, right? Um, and in fact, in the very early computers, it wasn't possible at all. Turns out that on modern CPUs, modern CPUs uh, actually use extra digits to calculate the intermediate results. Uh, okay, so what do we do with these extra digits? Right. Uh, so I said, uh, in this case here, uh, I said you could round or you could discard, right? Oh, sorry, instead of you, back here, right here. So when I computed this result here, when I wrote down Y, I kept all of the extra digits here. Uh, in our floating point format, we actually don't have all of these digits after the decimal point, right? And so I really shouldn't be keeping these digits when I compute the result, right? And so instead of keeping those digits, what happens if I just get rid of them, right? So instead of writing 0.0.00121, I throw away everything after the decimal point, right? And to get zero, so now you get 0, 0, 0 times 10 to the 4. Right? And so now when you do the sum, it's like you were doing 432 plus zero, right? And so now this kind of makes sense, right? This is why, and this is why when I sum these two values, I just get back the first value. Right. If you're allowed to keep extra digits here, it's possible that you get a better final result. Right? So uh, with addition, uh, everything happens the way I showed you. Funny things happen when you perform subtraction. So here we've got 10.5 and 9.98, right? So notice here the values were, oh, sorry. The values here are dramatically different, right? Their magnitudes are very different. Here the magnitude between these two numbers is not very different, right? The, diff the, er the difference between these, uh, sorry, the uh, actual difference here is just 0 0.52, 
right, which is not very large. But when you actually compute the difference here in our floating point format, right, we get 10.5 uh, becomes 105 times 10 to the minus one. Right? Now this 9.98 right, becomes uh, 0 0.99.8 times 10 to the minus one. Right? So if you believe that, or so if you are in the situation where you can't keep that 0.8, so I have to get rid of it somehow, right? so we throw it away, and now you compute the difference, right? you get six times 10 to the minus one, right? which is 600 times 10 to the minus three. Right? What's the true answer here? Right? So 10.5 times uh, minus 9.98, its true answer is 520 times 10 to the minus three, right? So notice we're in a strange situation here. I can write down the true answer in our floating point format without losing any precision, right? But I can't compute this value here to get the true answer, right? When I compute it, I get 600 times 10 to the minus three, right? If you take that to be the true value and you subtract 600 times 10 to the minus three, you get minus 80. Take its absolute value, that's 80. Right? And so the error between that number there and that number there is 80 alts, right? uh, which is enormous. Right? The IEEE standard says if you subtract, uh, if you do any arithmetic with two values, the final value should be within one half an alt of the true value. Right? So we should be within one half an alt, but instead uh, we're 80 alts away. So more than almost two orders of magnitude. Uh, more, sorry, more than two orders of magnitude away from the true value, right? So that's no good. So it looks like if we throw away the extra digits that we need in the, to, to write down y, uh, we're gonna run into problems. So what do you do? So in uh, modern hardware, uh, what ends up happening is uh, when you are computing the intermediate values here, you are allowed to keep uh, a small number of extra digits. So I think, Intel CPUs uh, keep 16 extra digits or something like that. I think they do the arithmetic with 80 bits as, instead of 64 uh, for double. So for our purposes, let's keep one extra digit. Right. What does it say? Okay, so that discard extra digit should not be there. Sorry, that's a cut and paste error. Keep, oh, sorry. Keep one extra digit. Right. So instead of throwing away the eight in this case, right, we're going to let an extra digit uh, exist for temporarily to compute the result. So 105 becomes 105.0. Uh, 9.98 becomes 99.8. Right, now compute the intermediate result to get 5.2 times 10 to the minus one, right? And now I can compute, I can convert that value back to its correct floating point value, which is 520 times 10 to the minus three, right? And so converting that number back to its correct floating point value is uh, called normalizing, right? You might have to round as well in this case, but we don't have to in this case. So you get 520 times 10 to the minus three, and that's equal to the exact result Right? So even though we can't really write down 10.5 and 9.98 uh, exactly when we uh, convert them both to the same exponent, right? if we keep one extra digit, we can. Right? And that lets us compute the correct final result, which is good. Right? We went from 80 alts of error to zero alts of error just by keeping one extra digit, which is nice. Right? So it turns out that if you use just one extra guard digit, it's not enough to guarantee that one half ulp of error, right? So for example, here's 110 minus 8.59, right? Write out 110 in our floating point format. Well, it's easy, it's 110 times 10 to the zero, right? 8.59 is 859 times 10 to the minus two, right? Make the exponent the same, right? So that becomes 8.5, now there's a nine, right? So with that second extra digit, we're not allowed to keep, we're not allowed to use it. So we're gonna throw it away, right? So instead of 8.59, it's 8.5. You can't keep the nine. 
right? We've already got the extra digit, that's why we're not rounding, right? So to round, you'd need a second extra digit. We don't have it, so we only have 8.5, right? Now do the difference and you get 102 times 10 to the zero, right? The true answer is 101.41. And so if you compute the difference between these two values, it's 0.59 alts of error, which is slightly more than the 0 0.5 required uh, by the IEEE standard. All right, so it turns out you need uh, two guard digits uh, in this, uh, for our little format, um, our floating point format, to ensure you get one half an alt error when you do simple arithmetic. Well, when you do um, addition and subtraction. Not clear what happens when you do division and multiplication. Okay, subtraction is in particular is um, is especially is uh, strange when you are working with floating point values. Right, so when you subtract floating uh, two floating point values, uh, you end up with uh, what's called sorry. When you subtract any two values, you end up what's called cancellation or loss of significance. Right, this says when you subtract two floating point values, but uh, mathematically, if you subtract two values, you end up losing uh, significant digits. Right, so here is a ten-digit uh, floating point number. Here's another 10 digit floating point number, right? Uh, they only differ by one, right? So when you compute the difference, so I take x subtract y, I end up with one times 10 to the zero, right? Notice there's uh, nine significant digits in x, there's 10 significant digits in y, right? The difference has only one significant digit, right? So you end up with this, uh, what's called cancellation or loss of significance, which is not surprising. The magnitude of your difference is smaller than the original two values, right? So um, uh, in this case, the difference has one significant digit, even though the operands have nine and 10 significant digits, respectively. Okay, so this is called cancellation because uh, your leftmost digits or your high order digits or your most significant digits cancel one another out. Right, so in other words, that one cancels that one, that two, can, well I guess I should work the other way around. There's cancellation here, 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 and here, right, all the way up to the one, right? These values are canceling each other out because that's the way subtraction works, right? So all of your significant digits uh, on the left, uh, from the left of the number, uh, they all become zero or smaller anyway, right? And so you lose all the significant digits on the left-hand side of the number. So this isn't strange, this is just the way subtraction works, right? So this is not a problem if your two values contain no error, right? You subtract the two values, you end up with the correct result, right? And so this is called benign, cancella benign cancellation. So cancellation always happens when you subtract two values because that's the nature of subtraction, right? If your values have no error, there's no problem, right? Compute the difference, it's the correct value. And so we say that the loss of digits is not important benign, right? Uh, that's not true when your uh, two inputs have some error. So catastrophic cancellation occurs when one of your two operands contains some error, right? Now, when might your inputs have some error? Well, they almost always have error in them when you uh, are working with floating point, right? Just writing down the number itself might end up in error because it, you can't convert the decimal number to binary. If you compute two floating point values and subtract them, uh, then you end up, uh, then it can be the case where you end up with an answer that is very far off from the correct answer. Right. So I wanna compute the roots of a quadratic equation. Right. So you pull out your uh, quadratic formula and you say, well, I need to compute b squared minus four ac. Right. So here I've got some, uh, I just made up some numbers. So b is 3.34, a is 1.22, c is 2.28. Notice I can write down all of these numbers exactly in our floating point format, right? There's no issue. Uh, they all have three significant digits. Okay, so I'm gonna work out the correct answer, not in our floating point format, but I'm gonna work it out mathematically, right? So I compute b squared minus four ac and I get uh, 0 0.0292, right? So I can, the value of b squared minus four ac can also be written down exactly in our floating point format. So I can write B exactly, I can write A exactly, I can write C exactly, and I can write its cor the correct value of B squared minus four AC correctly in our floating point format. If you look back here on the second line here, you can tell that you can't compute it exactly. 
right? I need six digits here and six digits here, and I've only got three, four if I include the guard digits, right? So something funny is gonna happen uh, in that step there. Okay, so what's the something funny that happens? Well, I have to compute B squared in our floating point format, right? So B squared is really 111.556, but I can't do that exactly, right? I can't write down the 556, right, uh, when I compute B squared. The best, the absolute best that I can do is hopefully I can compute 111.5 and then round that to 112, right? So that's the absolute best that you can do. So I'm trying to make this the absolute best situation possible for our floating point standard, uh, our floating point format. The same thing is true for the 4AC, right? Its exact answer is 111.264, right? The absolute closest that I can get in our floating point format is 111 times 10 to the minus one, right? So that's the best case scenario for B squared. That's the best case scenario for 4AC, right? Now subtract them and you get one times 10 to the minus one which is 100 times 10 to the minus three, right? None of the digits in the answer are correct, right? I can't even get the two correct, it's one in this case, right? So that's 100, that's 292, right? None of those digits are correct, the exponent's not correct, that's minus four, that's minus three, right? So I can't even get the correct exponent in this case, right? And the error between that and that is enormous in, in, number, in terms of the number of alts. Right? And so there is an example of catastrophic cancellation, right? You compute two floating point values, the computed values now have some error. When you subtract them, uh, because, the, uh, because of cancellation, uh, the final result ends up being very far away from the result that you expect, right? The true error is 708 alts, right? Which is very large. Okay, so if you are reading the notebook, um, the notebook, sorry, and you read the floating point uh, notebook, um, the notebook goes, uh, shows you some cases where you might be able to change your calculation to avoid uh, the cancellation, right? You don't need to know that for the purposes of this course, right? If you're curious about what, uh, if you're interested in this sort of stuff, go read the notebook. Um, it'll show you that sometimes if you're calculating some sort of mathematical formula, you can manipulate the formula to remove the error uh, or to remove the catastrophic cancellation, right? There's some, there are some examples that you can work through. I, I don't care if you work through them or not. Right. Okay, so the last little bit I wanna say about floating point numbers uh, is that uh, we've only added two or subtracted two values, right? When you're working uh, on the computer, you often have to compute stuff where you have to sum or take the difference of many values, right? Or you have to perform many arithmetic operations to get the final result, right? Every time you perform a simple operation, right, the intermediate result can have up to one half an alt of error, assuming your computer is following the IEEE standard, right? If it's not, you might have more than half an alt of error, right? So if you repeat a, a, an operation many, many, many times, or you have many operations in a row, those errors accumulate. Right? I have a whole half alt error, then another half alt error, then another half alt error, and so on and so on and so on, right? If you're doing lots and lots and lots of operations, you may end up with a, a value that's very, um, it, that has a very large error. Most of the time, or on average, the errors tend to cancel one another out, right? So your one value might be a little too high, the next value might be a little too low, you add them together and the error goes, right? So it might, uh, a lot, so you don't always get a huge error after performing many operations in a row, but sometimes you can, right? Now, so what is the operation that most of you are familiar with where you might have to do things over and over and over again? Well, it's if you compute an average value, right? I've got lots of numbers, I wanna compute its average, I have to sum a bunch of values together. So here, I'm gonna sum 1,001 values together, right? I'm using float because uh, float, it's a little easier to see the errors with float than with double. Right? Float has fewer digits of precision. Right? So I'm gonna take my array, I'm gonna put in 1,001, 0 0.1, right? And then at the beginning of the array, I'm gonna replace the 0 0.1 with a million, right? So I'm gonna add, I'm gonna compute the sum 1 million plus 1,000, 0 0.1s, 
right? 1,000 0.1s is 100. So the sum should be 1,100,000, right? Write your loop to compute the sum, and it prints out 1,125,000, right? So it looks like uh, Java can't even compute 1 million plus 0 0.1 a thousand times correctly, right? Uh, that number there is pretty far off of that number there, right? Okay, so it turns out in this particular case, uh, you can compute the exact sum correctly just by moving the location of the 1 million, right? So exact same code, except this time I'm gonna put the million at the end of the array, right? Now I'm gonna compute the sum, and if you run this, you get exactly 1,100,000. Right, and so what's going on here, right? You just have to look at the order in which the stuff, uh, the numbers were summed in. Right, so the first sum starts out with a million. Da, 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 da. Right, so when you add a million and 0 0.1, the 0 0.1 is a lot smaller than a million. So when you compute that sum, you don't get all of the 0 0.1 like I showed you earlier in the lecture, right? So that value there is smaller than 1 million point one, right? And now you add another point one, right? So that point one is much smaller than the sum of the two values there. So you don't manage to add all of that. You can't keep all the digits in that 0 0.1, you lose some of them, right? And so now that sum there is smaller than 1 million point two, and so on and so on and so on and so on. If you put the million at the end, Right, the problem goes away. Well, it doesn't quite go away, but it becomes, uh, the problem, the errors become much less, right? So the magnitude of the first 2.1s, it's the same, right? Their exponents are the same, so when you sum these two things together, the result is very, very close to 0 0.2, right? And now add 0.1, so it's very, very close to 0 0.3, all the way up to the n, Right, we're very close to 100, and now we add it to 1 million. Right, 1 million is much closer, sorry, 100 is much closer to 1 million than 0.1 is to 1 million. So when you compute that final sum, it turns out in this case to be the exact, to be the correct sum. And so if you look online, people will tell you if you're computing an average and it's a very long, and you, and you have a lot of numbers, you should sort your numbers first. Right, and that will, uh, that will, uh, hopefully uh, prevent this problem where you end up summing a large value and a small value right away, right? There's a problem with this, right? So number one, if you sort your, uh, if you sort your array or collection of values, um, that changes the ordering of the array or collection of values, which you might not want to do, right? Imagine you have a spreadsheet and you want to sum the first column, right? And to sum the first column, I have to resort, I have to sort that column. Right? And so you might not want to do that. You might want to keep your original data in the order that was in. So now I have to make a copy and then sort the copy. Right? Furthermore, sorting has complexity, best case complexity, n log n, which hopefully they told you in uh, 121. Right? But I'm just summing n numbers. So really, this operation should only take O n time. Uh, and it turns out someone actually worked out how to do this uh, without having to sort your um, original data. And so the person who wrote, figured out how to do this is, uh, his last name is Cahan. Uh, he's one of the architects of the IEEE standard. Uh, and he's also Canadian. Um, and so he figured out how to do this uh, quite a long time ago now. Right? If you want to know how that algorithm works, again, look in the notebook for it. Um, the details of the algorithm are there. And there's an example that you can run. Not going to ask you about it. But it's all there for you if you want to find out about it. Okay, so that wraps up floating point numbers. Um, that's all I have to say about it. Uh,